Right, here we are once again talking about Chelsea and not just Chelsea, their problems at Chelsea. How to fix problems at Chelsea. How many times have I made this video? I'm not sure. But it's a continuous loop. It's a continuous loop. And the fan base right now are in turmoil. Two wins in 14 games. It's understandable. But let's all relax this video. Let's take a bit of a chill pill. Okay, grab a cup of tea. I have mine right here. Finished already, but that means I'm already chilled. I'm already zen and I'm ready for this video. I've done so much research on this video. I've got stats to back everything up. We're gonna be going through three main things that are Chelsea's biggest problem right now. And that's how we're gonna break up the video. And I promise you, I'm not just telling you to stick around until the end of the video. I promise you, you want to stick around until the end of the video because the stats that I have at the end to back up one of the main issues is honestly gonna blow your mind. Quickly, before we get into the video, if you appreciate the research and hope that Chelsea come back to form, make sure to like the video video and subscribe to get us close to 3,000 subscribers but without further ado let's go into the first issue and the first one we've got to talk about is what the fans want me to talk about it's Graham Potter and mixing that in with time do we have to show patience now it's obvious two wins in 14 games is absolutely horrific it's sackable form 100% but are we seeing things since Graham Potter's come in that should give us confidence that's what I'm going to talk about and I'm going to talk about more stats later in the video but just for a little teaser I've done some digging on our expected goals and in our last six games our expected goal difference is 4.32 that's a positive of 4.32 that means in our last six games we have won the game accumulatively by 4.32 xg yet we can't get any results in those six games I don't know the exact results but I think we've won one game out of those last six drawn four and lost one that is not what you should be getting from 4.3 to xg and later in the video i'm going to have an even more damning stat on xg and further on the potter timing thing i think people often talk about what style of play does growing potter have what improvements have we actually seen but i actually want to disagree now maybe a month ago i'd agree we hadn't really seen much going on but since these new players have come in and yes they are world-class players but they're still as disposable and he still has to get the most out of them how many top 100 million pound players have we seen come to the premier league and not really been used effectively you have to give a bit of props to Graham Potter for that and I think in our last couple of games we've actually seen a style of play it's a direct style of play it's getting the ball playing in between the lines Jao Felix constantly in between the lines it sounds obvious but at least he's deploying a player to the best of their abilities that's something that manager in the past hasn't been able to do and not just Jao Felix obviously Jao Felix is the star man in our team but in the last game versus Dortmund for example I thought we got the wing backs really really well involved they're actually full backs now so it's even better to get them involved when they're wing backs you, they should be getting involved but when they're full backs you have to be slightly more conservative but against Dortmund Rhys James was completely back on form back from injury and driving through players like they weren't there Ben Chilwell came in for Mark Cook Correa and was such a breath of fresh air. I'm going to put a photo up now of the play areas from the West Ham game and the Dortmund game. This is where the ball was moving most for Chelsea, where they were attacking the most. If you look at the West Ham game, you can see the left-hand side was severely behind the right-hand side and the middle. But if you look at the Dortmund game, you can see how much more even it is. The left-hand side and the right-hand side are very similar and the middle has a very high arrow too. It's much more even and I think this shows how we've improved over the last couple of games. And that left-hand side was a huge weakness. A lot of people were complaining about. Well, we addressed it. We got chill well in we don't pass to Madrid more and it's working so that's something that a lot of fans have brought up as a weakness have we actually seen improvements has Potter actually done anything and I'm going to argue that he has is there more to come 100% there's a lot more to do specifically in the middle of the park and that's going to be our next topic but I do want to give Potter some kudos especially in the last five or so games we've seen an improvement a style of play chance creation chance creation a huge issue that fans constantly complained about what well, we can see the expected goal difference 4.32 positive in our last six games that shows we have improved right now we're going to talk about our second issue and it's an issue the Chelsea fans have been talking about for so so long but maybe stop talking about it as much when we signed Enzo Fernandez because some people maybe got taken in by you know how much of a Galactico signing Enzo Fernandez is how good he is and I agree I absolutely love him but the crux issue is still there and that is defensive midfield Chelsea still have to address the defense midfield area and this is for a multitude of reasons one purely because we need one right we need one to help us in transition to give us some defensive solidity not put so much pressure on the center backs but one of the main reasons why we need a defensive midfielder is actually to unleash another position and that isn't just the attack in general it's the man next to that defensive midfielder and that is Enzo Fernandez we saw against West Ham and if you ever watched a game of Enzo Fernandez his passing is absolutely outrageous and where does he usually do that passing from from in and around the area probably just off a couple meters off the area pinging balls in behind and we've actually seen it directly in that West Ham game 
a beautiful, beautifully executed pass to Zhao Felix and we score. No one else in our team can do that. But if you don't have a defensive midfielder, you're putting so much defensive duty on Enzo Fernandez that he doesn't have the freedom to go forwards. And to be honest, in general, defensively, he's not the greatest player. He's very good in like just pure tackles, getting stuck in, but maybe awareness. And also, as we saw, 1v1 against Adeyemi against Dortmund. Not blaming him at all. He shouldn't be left behind by himself. That's on our set-piece coach, Anthony Barry. But either way, you can see he's not a natural defender, but you don't want him to defend because you want his other qualities to shine. So how are we going to fix that issue? That's what you're all asking. Well, let's first talk about the short-term fix and then talk about the long-term fix. Short-term fix is we're not in a window right now. So who the hell is going to play that position? For me, the answer is Denis Zakaria and N'Golo Kante. Now, I absolutely love Mateo Kovacic. He's not been great this season. His dribbles per 90 have got, fell off a cliff, which is one of the favorite things about him. And definitely, I would still have him in the team. There's definitely a way to fit him in. But purely on that defense midfield front, having Kovacic and Enzo Fernandez for me, wouldn't work unless you're in a very specific game, like we saw Kante and Kovacic work against Liverpool last year in January. Doesn't really work as balance, but works in a high-tempo game. But anyway, my options are Denis Sakaria and N'Golo Kante. Let's go with Denis Sakaria first. Just back from injury, which is so, so good to see. On the bench versus Dortmund. I was surprised he didn't come on, but maybe Potter didn't think it was worth it when we were chasing a goal. But either way, for me, this is our most balanced pairing. Denis Sakaria is not a pure six, a lone six. I don't think he has the on-the-ball qualities for it. And also, he's not bad going forwards. But if you pair him in a double pivot where he can use his physicality his long legs they call him the octopus for a reason he can do some of the defensive stuff Enzo Fernandez can go further forward and get involved in play 100% he's the one physical profile we have in our team we obviously have Ruben Loftus-Cheek but he's not a natural defense midfielder I thought people were very harsh on him last game but he was actually all right but equally we all know we have to improve on that position and then the other option is N'Golo Kante now much has been made of N'Golo Kante a lot of people just constantly calling him a defense midfielder but he's not a defense midfielder we all know he isn't a defense midfielder we probably all got kind of schooled during the salary season when we were claiming why isn't he playing MDM why isn't he playing MDM well he was right he's not got the passing qualities for it but I think especially as a short-term solution if you bring in N'Golo Kante and just pray to God he doesn't get injured then have him as the defensive minded interceptions tackles getting stuck in and then Enzo Fernandez can take the passing burden off him dropping in deeper like we see in Liverpool's 4-3-3 when Fabinho used to be on form Fabinho and Thiago that kind of dynamic Enzo can be the Thiago Kante can be the Fabinho now obviously this might limit N'Golo slightly because we all know how good he is at dribbling out, evading pressure, but this is a short-term fix and it's a short-term fix for a reason. Obviously, he can still dribble. It's not like he's going to be completely hamstrung and Enzo has some defensive nows about him. If he sees Kante suddenly running out, he will drop in, but we might see slightly less of Kante dribbling and that's fine. There's a reason why it's a short-term fix, but the long-term fix is what's more exciting. The summer is coming and we've just spent about 600 million, so I don't know how much I can expect, but I've got you a three-man shortlist. And obviously there are some players that I just won't know that much about, like Ugarte for Sporting. I've heard good things about him, but I don't know too much. Kefren Thuram in League One. He's also meant to be very good. Don't know too much about him. But the options I can tell you that I know are good are Lavia, Caicedo, and don't turn off the video, Declan Rice. Now, I'm not the biggest advocate for Declan Rice. I don't think he's 100% the complete formula. And I also think he's going to be very, very expensive. But you have to put him in this video. Agendas aside, he's a very, very good defense midfielder. And we'd be very happy to have him in our team. But obviously, price matters. For me, out of those options, my favorite would probably be Romeo Lavia. I just think he fits it so, so perfectly. His injury problems may be a slight issue, but he's still so young. He's going to get past. And I think he'll be slightly on the cheaper side, especially if Southampton get relegated. Now, obviously, Caicedo would be a great, great pickup. Played with Graham Potter before, you'd think the adjustment period would be much, much less for that. And Declan Rice, the only thing that puts me off is the price. Not meant to rhyme there, but obviously a very, very good player. So those are very, very good options in that position, but 100% still a position after so many, I think half a decade at this point, that still needs to be fixed. Right, we're on to the big one now. The one I've been telling you guys to stick around for, because honestly, the research I've done for this and the proof I have is damning and that position will come of no surprise after the last game it's a striker now off the bat i will say people will say why didn't we sign a striker before well striker has been a position that chelsea have been trying to fill ever since didier drogba and then diego costa we haven't had a good one since we constantly kept buying strikers and none of them worked why because the crux issue wasn't solved obviously some of them just weren't good enough lukaku didn't help himself lack of defensive midfielder meant we didn't have any stability and no creativity meant there was no point in having a striker because they weren't having any service well we've got to the point now as i've demonstrated to you and as i'm going to demonstrate to you further just wait a second the stats will come we are becoming a more creative team still a long way to go 
we can still create more chances more consistently but especially if we look at the recent games which is i'm bringing up the recent games because people say what have we seen under graham potter well i'm going to show you we can see chances are being created so a strike is absolutely necessary so let me roll off some stats to you in the last 18 big chances that we've created we have converted two two out of 18 that is absolutely horrific 18 big chances it's not just a chance it's big chances two have been converted that is absolutely criminal now if we look at our last six games the pool that i've been using this whole time because as i said recent form shows how potter's improved from the past we have accumulated 10.43 expected goals from our last six games and we've converted a whole three goals 10.43 we're meant to score 10 and a half goals in our last six games. That's a very good metric. And you'll see why that's actually a good number to be creating when I compare it to other clubs at the top of the Premier League. 10.5 goals, we converted three. That's absolutely horrific. Now, let me put that into context with you. You might be saying, well, maybe you should just be creating more chances. Players miss chances. Absolutely. But let's compare this to the upper echelons of the Premier League, the clubs that we want to be emulating with our process, Ten Hag, Arteta, Guardiola. We want to be emulating this. Well, let's compare the stats. In Arsenal's last six games, they have accumulated 9.7 expected goals. That is less than Chelsea. Yet, they have scored seven goals, more than double of Chelsea. If we look at Man United, they have accumulated 10.38 expected expected goals over the last six games, yet they've scored 13 goals. That means that they have accumulated less expected goals than Chelsea in their last six games, but have scored over quadruple the amount of goals. And then the last one we look at is Manchester City. Manchester City, obviously a chance creating machine. The players they have in their team are ridiculous. 12.58 XG in our last six games. That is more than Chelsea. You have to give them props for that. But equally, they've converted 14 goals from that XG. Just like Man United, they've overperformed their XG. So what does this show? I'm not trying to give excuses constantly for Potter, but it shows that chance creation is actually coming about. We are creating these chances. And if you want to say it's all because of Jao Felix, Potter's still deploying this player. And it's not all just from Jao Felix. Other players are contributing and Potter's style of play for me is feeding into that. Yet we cannot finish our dinner. So what's the solution? Let's first talk about Kai Havertz. People go at Kai Havertz, scapegoat him. And to be honest, I've supported him way too much. I have to admit, completely useless. He's been absolutely useless for quite a while now. But equally to him, he isn't a striker. He shouldn't really be playing a striker. But the problem is with him that he says he wants to play deeper. But firstly, he's never played that well in that deep position. He doesn't really have that creativity in him. When he runs with the ball, he looks like an absolute donkey. And second, the player that we have in that position is Jao Felix. Sorry, mate, but you're not going in over him. So when you play up front, you just got to do your job. And at least with doing your job, you've got to actually run towards the goal. That's the, that's the basics. And against Dortmund, it was a crazy clip. He gets the ball, just run sideways. The goal's that way. Run that way. Don't, don't run sideways. Anyway, Kai Havertz clearly not good enough in that number nine position. So what's our short-term fix? Well, I've got two options for our short-term fix. One is using the strikers at the club, David Dash Fafana and Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. Yes, Potter, people will say, well, it's on Potter for not, you shouldn't have got rid of Aubameyang in the Champions League squad. And I understand that. I do understand that. But also, let's not, let's not pretend that Aubameyang is some saint that we were all saying was really, really good and then Potter suddenly threw him out of the squad. Would I have thrown him out of the squad? No, I probably would have got rid of Pulisic or something because Pulisic is out injured for a while and we have Sterling and Mudrick on the wing. But he got rid of Aubameyang and if the coach doesn't want to use a player, that's that. But anyway, in the Premier League, we still use Aubameyang. He's not the greatest player in build-up, but he can finish his dinner at least better than Havertz. And then David Dachrafana, a player that we haven't seen too much of, but he came on against Fulham and looked really, really bright. Now, neither of these solutions fill me with that much expectation. I'm not really sure if any of them are that guy, but I think it's worth trying them, especially Fafana. I think we need to give him a chance. He looked really good against Fulham, yet in our last two games, hasn't even come on. I'm not sure where the consistency is there. But one solution that I think is really, really interesting, that's something we could try, is trying the Man City setup of past seasons with a false nine. Xiao Felix as a false nine. This, for me, could work very well. What this all predicates on is Xiao Felix actually being able to play as a false nine. That's what it all predicates on, obviously, because he's our star man right now. We don't want to move him out of position and nullify him, because at the end of the day, if we nullify him, the team kind of falls apart. So... Let's just hope that he works as a false nine, still comes in between the lines, but is also able to go forwards. Graham Potter has said many times he's very good at coming in between the lines, but he's also very good at getting in behind the defence, as we saw versus West Ham. Very instinctive run, scored that goal, and obviously had the offside goal off Reese James. So, 
play him as a false nine, and then that also allows us to have a more compact midfield by playing a three-man midfield. It not only allows us to get personnel in there, because I think we have decent midfielders, Kante, Kovacic, Enzo, Zakaria, etc., but it also means we're generally more compact, less transition, and a three-man midfield will really, really help us. So I'm not saying this will work, but I think it's worth trying, because we still get to keep our star man in the team, because the problem is when we play 4-2-3-1, there's big gaps between the double pivot and Felix. As much as Felix is good, he's the attacking midfielder, but when we press, we go in a 4-4-2, he's pretty much a striker. And then there's a huge, huge gap for the double pivot to the striker. And teams play through that, especially when they have a three man field, which Dortmund had yesterday. So that is one solution for me. But long term is clearly a thing we're focusing on. And for me, long term, it's pretty simple, buy a striker. People mention Nkunku. I'm not going to pretend like I know too much about Nkunku. If you can be that guy, obviously, 100% gassed. I think people are overacting about the signing, saying he can't work with Felix. Just relax a bit. He's clearly an absolute baller. But aside from Nkunku, because I don't think he's that number nine, pure number nine, I think he likes to drop deeper, then I think we need to look at striker options. And I've got three striker options for you. I've got Ivan Tony, Vlachovic, and Osserman. Now let's go through them quickly. Vlachovic is just a pure striker for Juventus. For me, not my preferred option, but he knows how to get the ball in the back of the net. He's a pure striker. If we create chances for him, eventually he will score. But not my preferred option. I'm also a bit scared of buying out of Serie A after what happened with Lukaku. It's definitely not black and white. It's not linear. Just because he played in Serie A doesn't mean he's a bad player. Can't adapt to the Premier League, but I'm not sure he's the best solution. I'm not sure how good he is in build-up. But equally, I will admit, I don't watch too much for Juventus. But the second man I'll look to is Victor Osimhen. Absolute baller this season, just incredible. Napoli, probably the best team in Europe. Doesn't mean they're winning the Champions League, but their form is absolutely brilliant. And this guy just doesn't stop. And I think he's not like the most build up player. He doesn't constantly drop deep, but he is a target man. He can get the ball, he can win headers, and then he can play off the wingers. And he's an absolute finisher. And his range of goals is incredible. Every single goal I see from this guy is different. He's not one faceted, he's multifaceted. He scores on his right, he scores on his left, he scores headers, he scores volleys. 100% would be a good buy, but very expensive and once again coming out of Syria. Risk. 100% I'd be happy if we got Osman, but let's not pretend like there's not risk. We've been burned by this stuff before. My preferred option, probably, again, it is risky, but Ivan Tony. Now, it kind of sounds weird because he was literally playing for Peterborough in League One a couple years ago, and suddenly we're saying he's a Champions League quality striker. But if you look at his assets, look at what he did against Arsenal, but in general, if you watch Brentford, the perfect target man. So, so good aerially. Now, obviously, we aren't hoofing the ball constantly, but we weren't hoofing the ball constantly back in the day when we had Drogba, but sometimes you just need a target man. Play it off. Imagine. Imagine Ivan Tony, target man against some of the best centre-backs in the league, like we saw against Arsenal, and he picks it off, and Jao Felix picks it up and puts us through. That would be so beautiful play. And not only that, he's very good in the box, very good with the header, obviously, but also very good in and around the box. He's pretty clinical. So for me, Ivan Tony is probably the perfect solution. The only problem is he's English, he's playing in the Premier League, Brentford absolutely love him. I don't know about his contract situation, but he'd probably be quite expensive. And once again, a bit of a gamble. This guy was in League One. I'm not going to say for a reason, but he was in League One. So, you know, it's a big, big step up. But for me, he's shown the capabilities in the Premier League, not just as a striker, not just for scoring goals, but his general link-up play is absolutely absolutely excellent. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed this video. I put forward the biggest issues for me at Chelsea right now. Obviously, people just immediately say, get Graham Potter gone. That's the biggest issue. Sure, if you want to think that way, do your own thing. But even if you want Graham Potter out, you have to admit there are other issues that need to be solved in the Chelsea team. We have spent a lot of money already, but there's still issues to be solved and we need to be investing in those positions in the summer. So if you enjoyed this video, if you want to pay me back for a bit of research in this video, make sure to like the video, comment down below, subscribe to get us close to 3,000 subscribers. Subscribers and I will see you next time.